Welcome, everybody. So my name is Studio Redcorn. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of, of the Capture and Resilience Summit, along with Catherine Tuzinski. Um, uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, it, it's been a long time coming, and there's a lot of great poster, um, poster presentations and research presentations that we've seen today. Um, and, and I hope it culminates in, in, into something good. And, and we'll continue that conversation tomorrow at starting at 8.30 a.m. in Stewart Center uh, when, when Puck leads the, uh, the strategy sessions. First, I want to bring uh, Dr. Lee up to the stage. Dr. Lee is the director of the Ecological Sciences and Engineering Program. Um, the Ecological Sciences and Engineering Program has um, uh, puts on a summit every year, or, or a symposium as it's sometimes called. And um, this year we decided to do it in cooperation with the Office of University Sustainability. So you'll get to hear from both Michael Gulich, the, the director of that office, and, and first Dr. Lee. I just want to thank everybody for your active participation today. It's been an awesome day. But I want to thank most the uh, 2012 cohort and the leadership team that was led by Catherine Tuzinski and Studi Redcorn that was just here as our co-chairs. Awesome cohort. One of the biggest pleasures that I get to witness every year is to watch a new cohort come in and they're kind of floundering and trying to find their way and literally, you know, a year later, the professional development that's happened within them and the leadership and how they go forward. And I was telling people that when I attended their last meeting prior to this week, so that was Thursday last week, I felt like I was in a room of professionals. They acted like they had been doing this their whole life. So that's pretty impressive. So I want to thank the 2012 cohort and the current cohort um, that helped and volunteered to do a lot of the things behind the scene. And I want to thank our program coordinator, Crystal Musser. Raise your hand, Crystal. <laughs> Crystal helps with a lot of logistics for ESE, but besides that and beyond the call of duty, she is the right arm to our students. They can go to her, they can count on her, and she has offered both physical, emotional, all kinds of support through the symposium. So we are very thankful to you, Crystal. Thank you. And um, so I just, and I thank all the speakers and our sponsors and those of you that were willing to take time to be judges. You know, it's hard to be a judge. You don't get total freedom. You have a job to do. So thank you very much. And I hope you'll enjoy our speaker tonight. Um, and I thank Michael's office, the uh, sustainability office. Michael Gulick is an awesome sustainability director. So we're really thankful to have him. So welcome. I welcome all of you. And I hope to see several of you at the workshop tomorrow. Next, I want to welcome uh, Michael Gulich to the stage. Again, Michael Gulich is the uh, director of the Office of University Sustainability, um, and he'll kind of give uh, tell you a little bit about Green Week and, and what you can expect in the week to come. Thank you, and welcome to the Green Week keynote lecture. We have some great events planned for this year's Green Week. Studi mentioned that uh, tomorrow we have our uh, follow-up to today's uh, sessions earlier in the day, which were fantastic. We have our kickoff event for the Mid-America Cluster at 8.30 a.m. in uh, Stewart 214. Um, uh, tomorrow, there's also a tour of uh, urban water projects at 2 p.m. We've just added a second bus for that, and uh, we'll be leaving from the Armory parking lot if you're interested at, at 2 p.m. On Wednesday, we have our Alternative Transportation Expo on Centennial Mall from 11 to 3. Uh, we'll have two airplanes there that run on uh, biofuel on display, and we'll also be having test drives of, uh, of Nissan Leafs, if you're interested, which I'm very uh, looking forward to test driving a Nissan Leaf. Um, also on Wednesday, there'll be an open house at Schleeman Hall at, um, uh, from 12 to 4, and BGI will be giving tours of uh, the green roof there. Uh, on Thursday, we'll be celebrating Green Week at our farmer's market from 11 to 3 on Centennial Mall, and we'll be handing out reusable, uh, reusable shopping bags. Um, Thursday evening, Libraries is hosting a Green Week panel discussion at 7 o'clock at the Hicks Library. Then on Friday, we'll have our annual Green Week tree planting at 9 a.m. in the south parking lot of Meredith Hall. And Friday evening, we'll be kicking off our Friday Night Lights initiative, where students will be uh, moving around campus and, and uh, turning off lights and buildings for the weekend. 
And then finally on Saturday, the Wabash River Keepers are hosting a Detrash the Wabash event at 8.30 a.m. at Tapawingo Park. So uh, welcome again, enjoy Green Week, and, and enjoy the keynote. Thank you. Next, we're going to um, uh, do the, the 3MT awards. Uh, these, these people put a lot of effort into their presentations. If you got to see them, um, I think everybody was very impressed. They, uh, they first of all, had to submit a video. Uh, after submitting that video, they had to then come in and uh, present again. And they got coached in that process and all that multiple refinements before finally making the, uh, the final presentations today, and it really showed. So if I, if I could just have the 3MT competitors stand up real quick, and we'll give them a round of applause. I'm going to invite Helena uh, up to the stage. Helena put a lot of work into this process. If you were a poster competitor um, or, or a, a 3MT competitor, you've probably heard from Helena along the way. So uh, thank you very much, Helena, for all your work. Um, first of all, the, the People's Choice Award. So this is by all the voting attendees, uh, selected Andrew Wheezy. Come on up. I should note, uh, this event and the poster awards were made possible by a very generous donation from the Office of Interdisciplinary Graduate Programs. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to announce the, the second place winner is Aditi Kasari. And the winner is Ruchit Mehta. Ruchit, pre Ruchit's presentation was um, increasing human resilience against foodborne diseases through rapid biosensing. Thanks, Ruchit. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and Finally, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to give the introduction for our keynote speaker for the evening. Uh, so Bob's talk is going to be uh, capturing resilience and vitality by design, utilizing genius of place and regenerative design as a catalyst for community vitality. Just to give you a little bit of uh, uh, background about Bob. Bob Berkabala studied under Buckminster Fuller, was a veteran of the Vietnam War, designed the Kansas City International Airport, and co-founded the architecture firm now known as BNIM, and that was before the age of 30. Shortly after establishing the new firm, Bob led the design on a prominent hotel in Kansas City. In 1981, a miscalculation by the engineers led two bridges within the atrium of that hotel to collapse during a crowded party. Within an hour, Berkabyle arrived and was volunteering on the rescue team. 114 lives were lost and it was the largest structural failure, deadliest structural failure in US history prior to 9-11. Berkabyle was officially cleared from wrongdoing, but his perspective on the interaction of design and humanity was transformed, and his actions have since catalyzed the national movement. Berkabyle started lobbying the American Institute of Architects to address the sustainability of buildings, and in 1990, the AIA created the Committee on the Environment and appointed him its first chair. From that small committee was born the U.S. Green Building Council and the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Certification, or LEED, system, which has certified the environmental and social impact of over 10,000 buildings, including three on Purdue's campus. In the two decades since, the scale of Berkabyle's work has gone from single buildings to entire cities, and the level at which he pushes us to think has remained global. This includes greening the White House, revitalizing the Lower Ninth Ward after Katrina, rebuilding Greensburg, Kansas as a model green community, and working with the Ogallala Lakota on a plan to rebuild, a, a, sorry, build a resilient community from the ground up in what is known as the Thunder Valley Project. 
In 2006, Berkabile began pushing green design to the next level with the Living Building Challenge, which requires that a building purify more water than it pollutes and create more energy than it consumes. A team at Purdue, led by Dr. Rabinold, is designing what will be the first state university building to meet this standard at Purdue's Ross Biological Reserve. If successful, it will be only the 13th building in the nation to meet the certification since its inception in 2006. Please join me in welcoming Bob Berkabile. Thanks, Duty, and it's a real privilege to be here. I, uh, I just have to add my compliments uh, to the graduate students who were just honored, but in addition to them, all those who developed posters and those three-minute presentations. So help me again uh, congratulate all of them for their brilliant work. It's, I think that's uh, one of the reasons that I remain optimistic uh, and uh, show up at something like this to share some of my experience as it may inform, hopefully, our dialogue tomorrow. And not because it's my experience, but because I've had the great good fortune to work with a lot of communities and in a lot of diversity and a lot of different kinds of environments. And uh, I think more and more that complexity and diversity needs to be informing our future. And so I look forward to that opportunity to dialogue with you. Um, uh, and thanks to Michael uh, for hosting me and, pr and probably other sponsors beyond Michael. And, and to Sarah Vaughn, who, uh, for those of us who are coming in from outside, who makes all that possible by doing the logistics and, and being everywhere you need to be or anticipating what you're going to need before you know you need it. That's really, uh, really helpful. Uh, and to Studi and Catherine, uh, I know something like this doesn't happen automatically. <laughs> And particularly when you're in a graduate program yourself and then you take time out to organize something like this and all those that supported the two of them, um, uh, my, my, uh, my hat's off to you and the work you've accomplished. So, um, Studi, I shortened the title a little bit, sorry. <laughs> but as I was working uh, on the plane and thinking about it, first of all, that title didn't fit on this image. Uh, and secondly, uh, it was just not very memorable. Um, so um, I thought uh, Studi mentioned this in his introduction, but as I look at the last quarter of century of my firm's history, it, it's essentially because it was connected at the hip to the history of the green building movement. And when I look at our projects over that period of time and I look at the new tools and systems and approaches that have been created, what I realize is we started, I think, with pretty good buildings, and, and they were doing a good job for our clients and for the neighborhood or whatever within which they were being created, but they were relatively simple. And they had highly motivated, uh, very well-informed clients. And as I look at what's happening today, it's much larger, much more complex, uh, much larger budgets, um, much more complex teams and forces at work, and much larger opportunities for regeneration, or really having a, a proactive uh, impact on, on what we uh, hope to see in the future. I wanted to make this point. You may, you may remember that last year was the end of the world relative to the Mayan calendar. And I was making a presentation for the World Green Building Council in Guatemala City, so I did a little research into that. And I was struck by the fact that a lot of people were investing a lot of time and energy preparing for the end of the world. But when you look at that culture, they were not trying to define the end of the world. What they concluded was that they didn't know enough, and they hadn't seen enough, and they knew a lot would develop after they were gone that would be, create totally new challenges for the human race. And what they were convinced of is they had no way of anticipating what that might look like beyond 2012. And they were pretty clear that the folks who were alive on the planet at this point in time, in order to meet those new challenges, would have to rethink human life and culture 
and create a whole new operating system for moving forward if the human family was to be successful. And uh, I think it's important to remind ourselves of that. Just two weeks ago, I was at the Omega Center for, uh, in upstate New York, which was the first uh, building to be certified LEED Platinum and a living building. And every year since they've launched that building, they've had this workshop called Designing with Nature. Um, every year, the, the folks that show up, more people show up, and the people who do show up have higher profiles, and so this year the new face was Bill Clinton. And we couldn't, we couldn't house everyone last year, so this year it was live streamed. And I'd recommend for those of you who are interested in listening to some of the thought leaders, and I'll mention some, they were there, Bill Clinton obviously is one of them, um, Jeremy Rifkin, the English economist who wrote The Third Industrial Revolution, uh, Paul Hawkins, Janine Benyus, Biomimicry, uh, David Orr, and on and on. And what, what I think everyone came to together was A, that this is the most powerful moment in human history, B, that we can meet this challenge, it's not overwhelming, see that if we're going to do this, we're going to do it in a collaborative dialogue of discovery. And all of those conclusions, I think, by the folks who are assembled at Omega uh, are reasons for us to be optimistic. Now, if you look at the large pattern science, there are lots of reasons to be really depressed. <laughs> and so the lower image is an a, is a image from Antarctica. This is you're looking up at the globe. This is Antarctica. Africa, et cetera, and these are storm events. And at the bottom you can see a graph that makes it clear that the frequency and the intensity of these storms are increasing on a really dramatic basis. And there are a lot of reasons for that, but the most significant of which is warmer ocean, which is part of the genesis of that system. And, and we all know about what's the incidence of where those forces meet the built environment and what that's beginning to look like. So given that that's the case, given that the ice melt has uh, never been as accelerated as it is today, and that a year ago one of the glacier calves was the size of Manhattan. I don't know, how many saw Chasing Ice, the movie? Yeah, if you haven't, check it out. Um, so you can look at that, or you can look at the fact that when we look at the Colorado River, we're always seeing this wild water in the Grand Canyon, and this is the Colorado River before it gets to the ocean, the way it's looked for the last decade. So all of this, for me, indicates that we have been seduced into a very old operating system that if you go back to its origins, you find pretty much Bacon and Descartes who have seduced us into believing that Western scientific thought and specialization is a great way to proceed. And now we're learning, uh, maybe not. And so if not, what is a more appropriate way? And I'd like to explore just some things that I, that I think we're beginning to see. One is, as we all know, the economy, while people are a little bit encouraged about it in the last few months, the truth is, it's more unstable than it's ever been before, and we could easily imagine that it will continue to be unstable, and there are lots of reasons for that, but one of them is fundamentally when the formula for measuring, um, measuring success, the gross national product, only measures the flow of money. There's no, nothing in that equation that measures natural capital, human and natural resources. So if those are not a value in the equation, then it's an obsolete equation. And when we look at every primary operating system and doctrine that we're engaged in, water, energy, human resources, education, transportation, you'll find the same kind of obsolescence. And, and sadly, it's usually not, we're not talking about being a year or two or five or ten obsolete, we're talking a century, or in some cases two centuries. So one of my 
idols as an architect was Thomas Jefferson. He brought with him, on one of his trips to Europe, he brought back a new water doctrine. And he launched it in Virginia, in Washington, D.C. And we are still using that same doctrine. And I don't know about your communities, but I know in most every community in America, we have a major overflow control plan. And in my community, Kansas City, Missouri, that's about a $2.6 billion ticket in 2006 dollars. That's because that's an obsolete doctrine. It worked pretty well when Jefferson brought it over, but if he were alive today, he'd be shouting from the rooftops, wait. When we started this, we hadn't paved, we didn't have cities, and we hadn't paved, and we hadn't built all these buildings. And so that should have been adjusted more than a century ago, but we got stuck, and we just kept building the old system, and now we're seeing the failure. And we see those failures everywhere. Uh, that's a really good thing. Einstein forewarned us of this. He talked about needing substantially a new manner of thinking. He also said if you keep, re keep doing the same thing over and over and expect a different outcome, that's the definition of stupidity. And that's pretty much what we've been engaged in. In terms of the built environment, Bill Reed, a friend of a number of us, has created this really interesting diagram. And I think um, when we started really getting seduced by Western scientific thought, which led to the Industrial Revolution, we were pretty much here on the diagram. And this, the red and green, is about energy in this case. So we're using a whole lot of energy to produce stuff. And it worked pretty well early on. You know, it created jobs and all that. And it created abundance and affluence as we understood it at that point in time. And remember, when the Industrial Revolution took place, we thought the problem was not enough people to do the work. We thought we had abundant resources, but not enough people to do the work to make things to make us comfortable. And so if that was the problem, then the industrial system was an appropriate answer. But now you could say that's just upside down. Now we have a lot of people that don't have jobs, and we've woke, woken up to the fact that we don't have enough resources to go around now, let alone if we start consuming more and more and more. So wouldn't that be a good time to create a new operating system? So some would argue, and it is very arguable, um, that we're about here today on this evolution, and, and where we would all like to be is right at the top. And so sustainable design, maybe the lead rating system puts us right about here, um, as, we, as we go up and up to lead platinum and a living building system, maybe we're up at restorative, which is really assisting nature and, and being part of subsystems, improving all the efficiency of all the subsystems. If we get up to regenerative, it's really about us participating as nature, playing the role that we, I think, were created to play. Not doing less bad, but actually living a life and, and using our creativity, which we've been seeing this afternoon and this evening, to do something that is loving, regenerative, etc. So in terms of buildings, as was mentioned earlier, the Living Building Challenge was something we introduced, I think, in 2006. And really, it was about using only locally harvested materials and only healthy materials. And that means not only are they healthy for the people who are going to be in the building, but they were healthy for the people who somehow manufactured them and got them to the site. And generating more energy to consume, purifying more water than you waste. Uh, that's a tall order, and there are not a lot of them yet, but they are starting to happen, and as you heard earlier, one is in the works here. And what we've learned is once it's up, it becomes part of the pedagogical experience. It teaches by its very presence. So this was, this building in Rhinebeck, New York, at the Omega Center, was the first building to be certified LEED Platinum and a living building. One of the differences is a living building must, unlike the LEED system, a living building must be operated for a year and audited by a third-party auditor to verify that you're achieving all those goals. 
It's a really important difference, I think. This building is on a campus of about 150 buildings in Rhinebeck. And it is basically what you see here is the sewage treatment plant, not only for this building, it's a biological wastewater treatment system, but not only for this building, but for the 152 buildings on that campus. And as far as I know, it is the first sewage treatment plant on the planet that a yoga class has, has, has claimed as their venue. That's always a good sign for me. <laughs> it tells you something about the environment. So this was the day we commissioned it. Last year, these plants were, grew, grew up and started bending over on the ceiling. So this year, when we had the conference a couple of weeks ago, they had harvested a lot of those plants out and are now selling them as a part of the process or part of the revenue uh, for this facility. So these are the performance characteristics. I won't go into detail, but it's outperformed essentially every other uh, structure that any of us know much about. I want to shift now for a moment to the community scale because it's, it's good doing these buildings and frankly, to be fair to Omega, it's not just a building. It's about their watershed, it's about the community of Rhinebeck and now it's about a global family because people are showing up from Germany, South America, all over the planet to visit there to learn how that system works and to go replicate it or hopefully improve it in other locations. But at this point uh, in my career, we have helped 13 communities respond from, for, from, from a natural disaster. And I've learned some things in the process. Um, the first of which is, immediately after such an event, we are hardwired to rebuild exactly what was there at the earliest possible moment. And all the debate has to do with where are we going to get the money? Who's going to pay for this? Because the other interesting characteristic is there's never enough insurance, whether it's private insurance or federal, to rebuild what was there. And therein is a part of the opportunity. It takes a while to figure that out, and by the time you figure it out, if the community can come together in a dialogue and start imagining what they would truly like to, um, to experience, they could be in the process of doing that when they learn there isn't enough money to do what they thought they needed to do. Um, and so, as you can see, some of these are big like Houston and New Orleans and so on, and some are much smaller, and I'm going to pick the smallest because I think it's maybe one of the clearest examples, and that's Greensburg, Kansas. So Greensburg was eliminated from the face of the earth, but for that grain elevator, that's a lesson, Reinforced concrete cylinders attached is a very strong structure. Uh, I should tell you that I'm standing on what used to be Main Street looking north at the grain elevator. So keep that in mind because you'll see this same shot later uh, after some work had been done. The reason I picked Greensburg to share is because in those first, this started for me during the great Mississippi flood in 1993. And during that time, I had an international team of experts and we were working in communities that even I hadn't visited and like my planner was, uh, was from India and he had never been to the United States. So he was flying in from India and finding himself working in a small community on the Mississippi River Valley. And so I developed a process with help from a sociologist that I called community treasures. And we would ask people, we'd find the largest room available, usually a gymnasium, a regional gymnasium, and we would ask people um, three questions. The first was, what are the treasures here? Why are you living here, in, in other words? What's the beauty about this place? And in breakout groups, they would answer that and come back and report to the community. The second question was, what are the barriers? Why is it that you're children are going away to college and never coming back, for example, and many others. And they would answer that and come back. And the third question was, what would you like to create that you've never seen before? If you could do one thing different than you had, what would that be? And so I discovered that the sociologists had given me really good advice because I learned a lot about that community in a, in a long day, usually a Saturday, 
in one of those gymnasiums. So that was good news. The unexpected revelation was that everyone in those communities told me they had never felt a stronger sense of community because I had given them permission to share what was really important with their neighbors, and they did. And they learned that their neighbors, while they often felt they could not share these feelings because of a bad reaction that might come, they found a lot of their neighbors felt the same way they did. They just never shared that before. And so they began telling me how important that was as a community building process. So we used it over and over and we refined it. When we got to Greensburg, there was no large gymnasium left. There was nothing left for that grain elevator and we couldn't get everyone in those concrete cylinders. And so FEMA was nice enough to provide these circus tents for us. And no one lived there, so we had to invite them all back and we would serve a meal. And the first time they came, it was, a, it was an opportunity to greet one another because they hadn't seen one another since the disaster. So it was about saying hi, celebrating the lives of those who were lost, and then beginning a conversation about their future. So in this case, because everyone was driving there together, for the first time I found that all the women and children were present. And so when we asked these questions, normally they were being answered by white middle class males. <laughs> in this case, with all the women and children present, it changed the conversation entirely. And I'd, been, I'd known about diversity for a long time. I just never applied it in that environment. And so now, wherever we go, we're committed to the same thing. This is one of the two most conservative communities I have ever worked in in my life. They are, uh, for the most part, either two Tea Partiers or Agenda 21ers. How many have read Tom Frank's book, What's the Matter with Kansas? I recommend it. <laughs> it's a small book. It's an insight. He really meant What's the Matter with America, but he was from Kansas and he knew a lot about it, so that's the title. But they live up to that. They hate government. They think it's, we're all out of control, and they're kind of frightened about the world. Uh, and so when the governor called me the day after the storm and said, Bob, would you help me rebuild Greensburg Green? I said, well, we'd be glad to help, but I'd rather not go to Greensburg and say, hi, I'm here from the governor's office. I'm here to help you, because they hated her. <laughs> By the way, that's Kathleen Sebelius, who's now Secretary of Health. A brave woman, a smart woman. So we went as volunteers and we listened. And the more we listened, the more we realized we could not use the language we'd been using in that community. And so by using this collaborative dialogue of discovery, they discovered more about who they were and so did we. And by the time we began speaking, we were using their language. What they cared about were their children. And what they cared about was agriculture, which was declining. Uh, that's part of the breadbasket of America. And they get an average rainfall of about 22 to 24 inches, which is not enough. So the rest comes from the Ogallala Aquifer beneath them, which is receding at the most accelerated rate in recorded history. So that kind of worries them. Last year, they didn't get the 22 inches, they got five inches. And the people on the periphery of the aquifer are already running out of water. So those were the concerns they had. And so by organizing around those things, they became, the, they became the greenest community in America. They were the first city in America to adopt LEED Platinum as their standard. And I'll just, we won't go into this in detail, but I'll just show you a few other things. So they decided the, well, LEED Platinum was a standard for any building with public money, but just private homes or anything else, they decided should be healthier and more resilient, meaning more durable for them, than what they lost. And they wanted it to only consume half the energy of the thing they were replacing, and they, would, they ultimately decided that that energy should, become, should come from the very force that destroyed the town wind. So they now generate, in their municipal-owned utility, five times the power they ever consume, and they sell that to the grid at a profit. As I mentioned, water was really important, and so this town is designed to capture 
store and purify water and with a landscape that respects that and reminds them that they can do this differently than they used to, including the fields that they manage. So I'm going to share this story about the school because it tells you a little bit about that collaborative dialogue and discovery. The school superintendent, a really great man, decided literally the night of the storm that if he was going to rebuild a school and have any support for it from the state or the others that might have to fund it, he was going to have to place that school halfway between Greensburg and Buckland, the next town, and try to create a regional school. He was on Main Street. He called the governor and said, would you please ask the National Guard when they come tomorrow to start cleaning up to start with what's left of the school? Clear that site first. And he told her his strategy. And so they cleared that site and he began working with the school board to find a site halfway between Greensburg and Buckland and they bought a site. When we started working with the community on the plan for the new community, uh, we just sh we shared, we, we weren't re recommending things to them. We were only sharing all their options. And one of the options was to have the school on Main Street. And many of us thought it was important to the future of the town because of the vitality that that brought to the city. That those kids end up using a lot of the services on Main Street. Um, since the school board had already bought another site and they were pretty far down the road, the the, uh, because, again, the women and children were in this conversation, the children in the school began lobbying with the school superintendent and the school board about their decision. And they actually recruited some of their friends from Buckland, the next town, and they got up and presented to the council and the school board saying, you know, um, I would rather you build it in, on Main Street in Greensburg because that way, all, all of my friends in Greensburg can walk to school, and only we and Buckland will have to drive. If you put it halfway between, everybody has to drive, and there's no benefit to Greensburg, and they deserve a break. So this school, a K-12 school, is on Main Street, not where it was originally, because they'd already sold that land to a housing developer, but it's still on Main Street, and it's a platinum building, and test scores are up, health records are up, they're learning about integrated systems thinking in this school. They're understanding the landscape they built back manages water. And part of their science classes are about how this community operates like a living system, not like this Western scientific thought idea, which is all about engineering and pumps and pipes, and so on. So this has been cited by two presidents, Bush and Obama, as the best example of rebuilding after a disaster. It won an award from the Urban Land Institute and from the Financial Times in the UK as the best example of resilience and vitality in planning the future. Um, what's really important is that people in that very conservative community, one of which is Bob Dixon, who was here not that long ago speaking. Bob Dixon was the postmaster and he was one of these really conservative people. He was resisting this. He thought this was a crazy idea. But over time, he started getting educated, and now he's an eloquent spokesperson for how this community is operating and how it relates to the people who settled the community in the first place. And I'm, I'm really encouraged by knowing that that can happen. Not long thereafter, there was another F5 tornado in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and we were selected to, to help them rebuild. And so when we arrived, the mayor said, we've done a lot of research nationally, and you're the perfect firm to do this work because you do all this incredible community work. But unfortunately, what's happened, it took us so long to select you and get you here, we don't have time for that. That's going to take way too much time and too much money. And so we have, I have appointed a 40-person steering committee, and you can meet with them and just assume it's the whole community because they are, in fact, representative of the community. So we met that afternoon with them. There were 40 people. Uh, there were no women, and there was one face of color. Tuscaloosa is about 50-50 <laughs> in terms of color. And so I went back to the mayor and said, uh, this, I don't think, th I know this is not going to work for you, I know it's gonna, not going to work for us. And uh, if you really insist, then you, you should look for someone else. 
And my younger colleagues said, well, Bob, wait a minute. We've been using social media. What if we put more emphasis on social media? And we'll still do some community meetings, but not nearly as many. And let's see if we can come to a compromise. And I reluctantly agreed to that. <laughs> and he was exactly right. And the mayor agreed to it. And so we got started. The, we launched a website called Tuscaloosa Forward. This is it, using MindMixer, the software. And we had the first community meeting exactly two weeks later. And so always before communing, we ask best case, worst case, how many are going to show up? So we have enough facilitators, enough equipment, flip charts, et cetera. And on this particular occasion, as we showed up, as near as I could tell, more than twice best case showed up. We were totally overwhelmed. And as my colleague was ask, asking how many have been to the website, and 75% of the hands went up, the mayor's whispering in my ear, this is the most diverse meeting in the history of Tuscaloosa. And so we said, how many uh, visits do you think we've had with the website? The highest estimate that night was 3,500. The real answer that night was 39,000. Two weeks after we launched the website. It went on to 150,000. And in the end, 100 ideas that were launched on that website in that social dialogue were integrated into our comprehensive master plan and they were credited with those ideas. But it was vetted in that electronic dialogue of discovery. And they all participated in it at 1 in the morning, at 3 in the morning, sometimes with a borrowed cell phone from one of their friends because they didn't have a computer and they didn't have a cell phone, or from the library, or from the computers at their church. So this is what I've discovered through all of that. Meg Wheatley was right when she said, that there's no power greater than a community that has discovered what it truly cares about. And as we confront these issues that we heard about today and that each of us in our communities face, I think the real issue is what do we care about? And if we can, all, if we can have a common sense of what we care about in the future, nothing can stop that force. So now I want to come to looking at a couple of examples of how we can initiate this kind of thinking without a natural disaster. <laughs> I would argue that we are all confronting the largest man-made disaster in every community every day. And it's this old Western scientific thinking, these old broken models that we're still so seduced by. So how do we call that question? with some urgency and start developing new strategies that are appropriate to deal with these issues or to turn these challenges into opportunities. And Oberlin, Ohio is an example, I think, that is moving in that direction really well. And those of you that heard Puck earlier uh, will know that this is part of a larger plan. But so this is Oberlin, downtown. And most people think of it as a fairly affluent community. But the fact is, I don't know if you can see this, but um, it's a city of about 10,000 now. And 28% are below poverty level. And 52% have free meals in the schools. So people think it's affluent because of Oberlin College. And Oberlin College is affluent. And that's a nice thing. Uh, for example, their museum, which you'll see later, I think has uh, one of the most valuable art collections of any college in America. But the community doesn't enjoy that. And as you know, it's uh, obviously in the same region you are. Um, this is their watershed. We always try to look at the large, first we try to go back to understand the genius of place, 10 to 12,000 years. And we always look at the context within which this system is operating, the local system. And we like to start with a watershed, air shed, job shed, you name it, to try to get a sense of what kind of an operating system we're working with. So here you see in the center the, the city of Oberlin. Uh, and as we do this, we, tr we try to think of this in terms of urban metabolism. And so looking at the flows of everything. What does that look like? And is it an elegant? flow, or is it wasteful? 99% of the time, it's very wasteful. 
because, again, it's that Western scientific thought idea, take, make, waste. But we have found, for example, one of the easy ones is food, that if you really look at food, you can, you can make it a closed-loop system. It becomes very elegant and very healthy and, and no outside inputs. You know, it's a, it's a self can be a self-contained healthy system. And by so doing, you can add to the vitality of the soil. So looking at the same thing in terms of an industrial thing, this is a study we did uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, a byproduct a synergy study. And so what we really looked at were what are all of the corporate institutions and particularly the manufacturers importing and what are they getting rid of? What is their waste and what, are, what other people are buying and what are they wasting? And what we discovered is a lot of them were taking waste to a landfill that another company was actually buying as an input. And so we could start networking them and take one thing that they're spending a lot of money on getting rid of waste and somebody else is spending a lot of money on buying exactly the same thing as an input and just shortening that cycle and improving their overall efficiency um, and the quality of their work. So this is in effect, an input-output diagram that we did for a campus in North Carolina. The University of North Carolina is creating a new campus because they're out of room. And so it's about two miles from the current campus. And this was a way to look at that, and eventually this will become a circular diagram. Again, all these things are just disappearing. It, each one of those is an opportunity. And so we start looking at it as a whole operating system. We can start re-examining those relationships and changing that diagram dramatically, which adds up to literally millions and millions of dollars. So in Oberlin, what you see here, and all of this is the campus with the campus green, and then the town is here. And so there was a decision made primarily by David Orr and the senior administration to make a pilot for the Oberlin project, project. So the Oberlin project is a regional plan like you'll be talking about tomorrow. And I'm going to grossly oversimplify here, but I think it may be the first region to create a post-carbon economy. And so it's hard sometimes to implement this at a regional scale. And so a decision was made, let's do a pilot that's one block on campus and see if we can get started there and make that a tool or a lever or a catalyst to create the larger system. So this is that block, and that is the art museum that I mentioned uh, that has the phenomenal collection and some really important other buildings, and then some that are not so important and really need to be replaced. So that's the art museum, just been renovated. Uh, this is the district. I'm not going to go into detail, but I think I'm going to go through these images and it'll give you an idea that we're looking at it as an operating system. Uh, so the buildings in white are the existing ones that are being restored and renewed, and then the rest obviously is a new construction. And what you'll see as we're looking at all these different operating systems, these are like input-output diagrams in a way, a water collection, living machine, again, is waste, only we're trying to eliminate the waste, so we're using the nutrients as waste as a part of a product that creates fresh water and, and it becomes a soil additive. And the food waste becomes part of that system as well, creating more topsoil and more organic capacity on campus. Whoops, sorry. So the tempered water loop, geothermal wells, the solar energy, David's building, um, which was the first high-performance uh, building in higher education, is now, it didn't the day it was built, but it now generates more energy than it consumes. It's really performing at a very high level, and so we've learned a lot by that, and, and we're starting to design now a block at a time to get that same kind of result. And then, Interestingly, I mentioned the economy in this town, and mo the poorest people in town live here, and the school they attend is on the other side of campus. So they walk every day right through this campus and back. 
And so part of this is about creating a living system in the form of a food forest, edible landscape, and water management that will be part of the experience in walking through the campus in the future so that they get some education just by being present. And then integrating all of those systems into one operating system so that we get this uh, exponential improvement in efficiency and performance as a result. Whoops, sorry. I really want to go back to this. So in Oberlin, and in most of these communities where we're working at a community scale, what we're finding is one of the opportunities for breakthrough comes when you look at the relationship between natural systems and cultural systems. And so you start examining these intersections on the relationships. When you change the relationship, you have a very good opportunity of changing the performance of, if not all the systems, all the components, most of them. And so we're more and more looking at this kind of an opportunity and not making a decision just about, for example, communication or economic system. We're looking how it relates to every other aspect of the community. So Puck mentioned this earlier, and I think we'll be talking about it some tomorrow. Uh, this is this Lake Erie cluster. Here's Oberlin and, and the obvious cities. You know this area as well or better than I. But there's a really good opportunity when you're looking at this scale, again, to do this by product synergy and a natural operating system to get exponential change in the overall system. So I'm going to close with an example at the project scale again. I'm going to go back to that. But looking at these projects more as a part of community vitality. So this is back in my home, Kansas City, Missouri. And the neighborhood you see in the image above is uh, what our Congressman Emanuel Cleaver and I call the Green Impact Zone. But our newspaper, the Kansas City Star, recurs, refers to it as the killing zip code for a reason. And the reason is there are more deaths by gunfire in that zip code than all the other zip codes in our region in aggregate. So when you look at this community, what you find is, and this school was abandoned 15 years ago by the school district. So it's been empty for 15 years. So we, we've been working in the community as volunteers, helping them create a new vision, like we do in post-disaster uh, environments. And this, frankly, is a post-disaster environment. This started post-World War II. And I'll try to show you how it did start. So you see, on the left, you see the school. And when you look around the school at the houses, you'll notice about half of the houses are missing. Now when you look at a larger map, this is the map of that part of the city, this line, that dashed red line, is Troost Avenue. West of Troost Avenue is Hyde Park, where I live. East of Troost Avenue is this neighborhood called Mannheim Park. So notice the difference in density here to here. They used to be exactly the same. That started changing in following World War II uh, with the uh, National Highway and Security Act that President Eisenhower created, along with um, loans for veterans, returning veterans. So what happened was the developers started creating an industry to build new houses and new highways to greet the returning veterans, and the returning veterans had low interest loans to buy those houses. And a couple of years into that, they got really good at it. So for example, in my community, one of the builders alone could finish a house a day and was finishing a house a day, J.C. Nichols, who created the Urban Land Institute and many other great things. But some of them started thinking, well, wait a minute, pretty soon we're going to run out of veterans. <laughs> and we have all this capacity. And so wh what did they do? They created a strategy that later became called blockbusting. So they just picked this area, and they would, they would go to that area and buy a house there. This is all white, middle class neighborhood, front porches, great little sidewalks, uh, tree-lined uh, lanes. And they would buy a house, and then they would find a black family that could qualify to buy it, and they would put them in. And the same in the next block, and the next block, and the next block. And the white folks there started thinking, whoa, this, this is scary. 
And so they started moving out to those houses that were being finished one a day. After we ran out of veterans, we started taking people from the urban center and moving them out to the suburbs. That happened all over America. That's not unique in Kansas City. So as a result, the economic profile of this neighborhood went way down, fear set in, and over time, poor education, less jobs, more drugs, more prostitution, gang wars, and a lot of these houses were lost to fire and other issues that come with that environment. So that's, that was the condition when we started working with that neighborhood. So we spent time listening. You all know about these wordles. Is that everybody familiar with that? Okay. So we listened to that community, and clearly you can see the things that were important to them. And so if we were starting to work with them, trying to decide what can we do to make a change, it came out that the first priority was to find a way to buy that school and repurpose it to become the force in their community to provide training, to provide a sense of community, to provide education, to give them job skills, et cetera. And so we were fortunate to find a number of people to help us do that, and these are some of the partners, and I won't go into that, but I will say it's important to have diverse partners with capacity to be with you when you're trying to do something as a change agent in a community that no one has been willing to do any financing in for a couple of decades. So it's really, these are, amazing the people that helped us do this. Now what I've started calling this is urban acupuncture. So if you look at this school, my project architect's been standing on a can on this corner and taking a shot once a month, and you can see what's happened through the winter and eventually we'll end up where we were last month. So. What's really important about this is, first of all, this is a LEED Platinum project. And we use stack financing, uh, low-income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, um, and, and really great capable partners, but we still didn't have enough. We had enough to build this, but we didn't have enough to introduce the programs that would truly make this transformative or catalytic. And so I went to Brad Pitt and Make It Right in New Orleans, with whom we'd been working since the, Katrina, uh, and asked if he would be willing to provide some of the same philanthropy here that we had been using in the Lower Ninth Ward. And I believe we will get a lot more leverage in urban centers like this than we have, frankly, in New Orleans. And he agreed to do that. And so with that additional uh, leverage, we were able to have a health clinic for the community, operated by our public hospital, Truman. We were able to have a computer lab for the kids, a community center, community gardens, water management, and photovoltaic systems powering the, 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 uh, this part of the neighborhood. Two Saturdays ago, I was at the Neighborhood Association meeting. This won't be occupied until the first quarter of next year, but already crime is down 29% in the last two months. Just seeing this happen has given reasons for the people, residents in the neighborhood to be optimistic. And some of them are being in job training programs who are training them how to build this school. And after the school's done, they'll be building their own structures elsewhere and on and on. So with this, I've started this little development company that we are focusing on urban acupuncture. My current definition is that urban acupuncture is a strategic investment of leadership, design, and capital at an important place, at a critical time, to stimulate catalytic positive change. I know that's too long a definition, but that's what it is. And over time, it will evolve to be a right way of describing this. But I'm seeing a lot of opportunity for it. So we have created a little development company that has made offers on 10 schools. And I'm only going to describe this one because it'll give you an idea of how taking all these concepts and putting them in one place uh, can make this uh, catalytic change take place. So in this case, this was a high school. 
This was originally designed and built as a junior college, but in its more recent life, it has been a middle school. And with the middle school came a new communication center like TV lab and a two-story parking garage, and as you can see, sports fields surrounding these schools. And they've been empty for about six years. And so we offered to buy those two buildings, and here's what we hope to do. So that was the high school. My father went to that, this high school, and I live across the park, so I'm, I see this up close and personal on a regular basis. So uh, this slide's a little out of date, but I can just tell you briefly that the middle school, we're making uh, the Center for Community Vitality. And in that school will be, what was a school, will be housing. There will be a part, about 85 apartments will be there. And it will be a mix, I believe, of course, we're just now beginning, we're trying to close on the contract, so we have a lot of work to do, but our assumption is it will be um, people my age and millennials, <laughs> a blended community, uh, because we have similar interests. We want to occupy less space, but we want more quality of life, and we want a lot of services. So we have that in common. And some of us have more time than others. And so you get a lot of synergy by having that kind of a mix. In addition, we have six not-for-profits that are the best in our region. One is called Bridging the Gap. It's a 20-year history of helping us understand how we get from where we are today to where we need to be in the future and teaching others to do it. One is called the Metropolitan Energy Center, which is all about energy efficiency and renewables and alternative transportation. One is Kansas City Healthy Kids, which is about teaching us about health and particularly in the school systems. One is Cultivate Kansas City, which is our best urban ag organization in our region. One is the Environmental Health Division of Children's Mercy Hospital. So they would all be living for the first time together in the same space in the new addition. And what were sports fields will be converted to urban gardens and a food forest and a fish farm and a water lab, et cetera. And as you can see, we're covering the garage and other parking with photovoltaic and uh, taking all the waste from both buildings and, and converting it to nutrients for the gardens. So the high school, what was the high school, is a center for creativity and innovation. So the three pilot schools there and an innovation lab um, and an incubator and so on. So I'm going to run through these rather rapidly, and I can't describe them all, frankly, because uh, it would be insulting for you and your schedule, but I'm just going to take one example on this one and tell you a story, and I could tell you similar stories for all the others you're about to see. But these young people here are in an organization called Mind Drive, which is a not-for-profit after-school program that I, and I chair the board of Mind Drive. So all the kids in Mind Drive, the year we built this car, lived in the killing zip code. Uh, and they were at, in, in our community at the high school of last resort. That means they've been in jail once or they've had two drug busts and they can't get back in their school, so they can apply to De La Salle, the high school of last resort. And my, my former employee, good friend, taught a class there called Creativity. And because he loved cars, he taught them how to design cars. <laughs> and they were doing drawings and then clay models and taking the clay models to a wind tunnel to see which car performed the best. And four years ago on the way back to school, the kids said, Mr. Reese, couldn't we make a real car? And so three years ago, they designed and we built this car. And we called Bridgestone to uh, get tires for the car because we knew they were working on low friction tires. So I said, sure, we'll, we'll do that. And they came and showed us these, uh, brought the tires. But when they saw this car and these kids, they just completely flipped out and said, we'd like to take the car and the kids to our test track in Texas, which they did. <laughs> we found on that test track that the $10 million XPRIZE electric car got the equivalent of about 137 miles to the gallon. Our car got 444. Now, these are all kids that were kicked out of their school. They all live in the killing zip code. Most of them have single parents, and they were in a dead end. And now they have scholarships and now they're inspired, and every class since has been doing similar work. So our class last year uh, took an old Carmen Ghia that was rusted out. We bought it for $350, completely rebuilt it from the ground up, threw the, the, the uh, gasoline engine away, 
put an electric motor in it, and we decided to drive to Washington, D.C. for a meeting with Congress, and we drove it on social fuel. That meant we had a switch between the battery and the electric motor. And the only way to get the switch closed was to have somebody like you on Facebook or tweet you, and each of those was worth about three or four watts. We needed a lot of watts to get to Washington. And as chairman of the board, I was a little worried. I liked the idea because we needed to give the kids a lot more exposure. But I also was concerned that if people lost interest halfway, we wouldn't make it to our appointment at Congress. And it was real time. I mean, we had an iPad on the dash, and the whole world knew whether we were getting you know, the switch closed or not. So the good news was we launched this website a week before we left. And the day we left the Union Station in Kansas City, we had enough social fuel to get to Washington. And we announced that and said, please continue liking us to fuel our conversation with Congress. By the time we got to Washington, we had one billion hits. And we had people like Nancy Pelosi liking us, and we had Richard Branson writing blogs on our behalf. By the time we got back home, we had an affiliate in Melbourne. And now we have requests for affiliates all over the planet. So that's what's possible when we work together in a collaborative environment to reclaim our genius. My professor, Bucky Fuller, said we're all born geniuses and we're gradually de-geniused by our parents and our teachers. Sorry to the faculty. <laughs> but these kids are reclaiming their genius and we all have the right and the capacity to do that. And so what this entire project is about is to immerse adults and young people in an environment where we can reclaim our genius and we can redefine community um, and vitality. So I mentioned Cultivate Kansas City. So we will, they, they will be, whoops, sorry. They will be growing food on those sports fields and we'll be walking at about 100 feet to this culinary institute and they'll be teaching the community and other schools how to prepare healthy food and we'll be taking all the waste from this back to nutrients for those gardens and creating more topsoil. We'll also be working with the neighborhoods that surround it. Three neighborhoods touch these schools, and so the Cultivate Kansas City folks will be teaching that neighborhood, those three neighborhoods, how to create an edible landscape that's beautiful and a food forest that's productive. Now, I mentioned overflow control before. This system will take care of all of its own stormwater and wastewater. The neighborhood which in which it's located has a $154 million price tag to solve that overflow control problem with the sewers. So if we did this instead, that $154 million would be available to spend in more intelligent ways instead of more pipes and pumps. So here are some of the other operations that will be there, again, I'm not going to try to describe each one. I might mention that the concierge service center, think we're calling this uh, the, ego, the eco concierge, but it's really what it is is a life coach because we have developed this lifestyle that is so bizarre, we don't know how to live a good life. <laughs> and so we're in a community where all these systems and services are available. Some, we need a little coaching about how we use them and how we can improve the amount of joy in our lives and our health at the same time. So Janine Benyus had sa has said that life creates conditions that are conducive to life. And for me, that's kind of the bottom line with all of our thinking. When, when we're making proposals, when we're seeing those three minute presentations, when we're looking at these boards, is the aggregate of what's being proposed something that will increase the capacity for life? And if so, that's then regenerative. And those are the strategies we need to float to the top and support. And the ones that can't answer that question in the affirmative, we can say, nice work, but not today. We're not doing that yet. We don't have time to muck around with things that are just incremental improvement. It's time for transformative, uh, catalytic change. Whoops, sorry. So this will be the community we do first uh, of these two. At this point, the school board is only offering me the contract on, the, on this school, not the other one. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and start this, and maybe that would be a way we could prove to them we should 
be given the right to do both. Um, and then, last Friday, I signed a contract to close on this building in downtown Kansas City. So I'm not going to explain this, but think of it as a vertical neighborhood. So it's all the things I just talked about in the high school and the middle school, but it's in a 30-story, half-million-square-foot office tower. So we'll leave about half of it as office space. The other half will become residential. And all the services that allow that to be a quality-of-life neighborhood with, with uh, real connectivity, uh, where young professionals can have not only daycare, but early learning center on the lower garden level, where they, they're right on the new streetcar line so they can get anywhere in the city they want to go. They can walk inside five blocks to the best grocery store in our city, et cetera. So this is about organizing that thinking in the same way, but in the center of the city in a high-rise building to see what that looks like. With all our work, I'm more and more requiring all of us to answer this question. This is one of our clients at Pine Ridge. And we keep imagining what will she see in the year 2020, the year of perfect vision. By then it will be obvious that what you're doing here is answering those questions appropriately or not. And so I, I want the answer to be yes. <laughs> I want her to see in the year of perfect vision that what you did here as a part of a regional strategy transformed this region to redefine prosperity and to add more conditions that are conducive to life. And so if we can do that, I think we're going to be, and you're going to be, uh, optimistic about the future. So. Um, I'll be glad to answer questions later if some of you have them, or tomorrow. I hope to see some of you tomorrow. And if you want to be in a conversation with my colleagues, you can see lots of ways at the base of this slide to continue that conversation. Uh, and so for now, thank you very much. So uh, in a moment, we're going to announce the, the poster winners. Um, if we can get Helena up here to, to uh, <laughs> give us the results. But before we do that, um, Bob's talk was, uh, was sponsored by Discovery Park Lecture Series. And, and Discovery Park is, is very generous in, in bringing uh, notable people to campus. And with every speech, they, they do a custom design vase for that speaker. Um, it's designed by an artist here in Lafayette. And um, this one is, is a sun uh, blown in glass. So uh, we just want to say thank you for being here. And we also have a gift uh, via People's, People's Brewery uh, for you as well off stage. So um, please, uh, please give another round of applause for Bob Burkbaugh. Uh, if you are a poster winner, I, I apologize. We'll, uh, we'll get the results out pretty quickly and uh, let you know who won. But thank you guys all for coming. Tomorrow, um, jump in here if I'm missing something, but at 8.30 tomorrow, we will start the smart growth sessions. Um, sorry, the strategy sessions. Those will be led by uh, Mark Mickleby or, or Puck, if, if is what you probably call him if you met him sometime today. Um, the whole idea behind this is that, that we start solidifying ideas for this region, um, building identity and building connections with, with other universities, businesses, um, and, and, and stakeholders in the region. So please come, please contribute ideas, uh, get involved, and um, we, we'd love to have you. So thank you guys for being here, and if you are a poster winner, we'll, we'll get to you here pretty quickly. <laughs> Thanks a lot.